Christianity has uh, some unique words um, that we use. Um, many of them kind of show up around the Easter season. Um, but the reality of kind of a unique vocabulary is not just a religious thing. Okay, any field of specific inquiry, uh, a field of particular interest, has its, its vernacular. It's got its, its, its language that you need to learn in order to kind of talk in that field. So, I mean, most people know the difference between an SUV and a sports car, but if you're a car guy or a car gal, right, you know the difference between a supercharger and a turbocharger, and you know what it means if the car has been chipped, you know, and you know if the exhaust has been tuned, and maybe you even know how to do all those things on your vehicle. Um, language that's specific to kind of our interests. I grew up with, quarter, with horses. Um, my mom and my sister uh, were accomplished um, horse women, and uh, registered quarter horses. We had some beautiful, beautiful creatures in our barn. Um, it meant that the dinner table uh, often was resplendent with uh, talk about horses. Um, you know, it was a stallion that's going to breed with the mare and result in the best bloodline for our mare. Uh, it was conversation about veterinarian language that you needed to know and understand. I mean, everything from the simple that every horseman needs to know about the signs of colic and how to recognize it early and what to do and when it's desperate and you need to call the vet um, uh, through to just kind of simple, you know, parts of the horse. The fetlocks differ from the withers. And, you know, I mean, it's just stuff, right? It's language and it's true of Christianity and when you get around Christmas, uh, sorry, Easter, we're not at Christmas time, we're at Easter time, <laughs> When you get around Easter time, um, there's language that gets thrown around, and I think one of those words that sometimes gets used and then just kind of glazed over is the word resurrection. Resurrection. And, and so this morning we're going to kind of explore three questions around this word. Firstly, just straight up, what is resurrection? And then sec secondly, why did Jesus need to be resurrected? And then thirdly, will you be resurrected? So what is it? What about Jesus? And then what about you? That's the outline on the sermon notes. If you pull them up in your app uh, or if you download them from the website, uh, we've got a few copies in the sanctuary here as well. Uh, we're, we're picking up where we left off last Sunday, Easter Sunday. We went to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And that's in, toward the end of a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in the ancient city of Corinth in the Mediterranean that he had helped start He's been addressing some problems that were present in the church, if you've ever had a chance to read through that letter. And we get to chapter 15, and he's, he's clearing up, making sure that they are utterly clear on what was up with the resurrection of Jesus. And so we pose these three questions. I'm going to read kind of an, a big stretch of this, uh, 12 through 28. Um, and I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation, if you're flipping through different translations on your Bible app. Um, that'll give you a little cue, or it's going to be on the screen here with me. So this is the word of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 12. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that there will be no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would, be all, would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. And you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. 
But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest, and then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come, when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For the scriptures say, God has put all things under his authority. Of course, when it says all things are under his authority, that does not include God himself who gave Christ his authority. Then, when all things are under his authority, the Son will put himself under God's authority so that God, who gave his Son authority over all things, will be utterly supreme over everything, everywhere. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, help us understand it this morning. Help us apply it in our lives. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So what is resurrection? And in this passage, Paul has used the word like 11 times. And and some people in this ancient city of Corinth, in the church in particular, were saying, look, this resurrection is not a thing. Or at least it's not a thing as it relates to you and me. Uh, And there were others who were saying, of course it's a thing. This is a really important thing that we all need to know and understand. But before we get into it, let's just clarify what is resurrection. What is it exactly that they're talking about? So of course, the context even tells us resurrection is referring to coming back to life after death. But that's not enough. It's more nuanced than that. Uh, Because Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, but the scriptures never call that resurrection. In fact, there are accounts through the pages of the scriptures where people had been raised to life after death, but it was never called resurrection. There's a big difference between what Lazarus experienced and what Jesus experienced. They both were dead, and then they were both alive. But Lazarus was resuscitated and Jesus was resurrected. Lazarus died and then Jesus spoke life back into his old body. Lazarus came out of the grave, but Lazarus would go back into the grave eventually. He died again. If we were to use, let's use a car analogy, I'll take a risk here, and and say maybe, maybe it's something like this. So I've got a picture of a 1965 uh, Mustang convertible on the screen behind me here. Um, let's say you know that that vehicle had, had was spent, worn down. Took it into the garage. Engines blown, transmissions blown. Drivetrain is a mess. Electronics are fried. It is time for a complete refurbishing of that great classic vehicle. And, and so stripped down to the frame. It's a unibody, so it doesn't actually have a frame, but stripped down, rebuilt, repainted, new parts, good as new, maybe even better than new, and it's good to go. Lazarus was a 1965 Mustang convertible, (laughs) fresh out of the shop, okay? Um, Jesus, on the other hand, was a 2005 Mustang convertible. Now, I'm going to put a picture of, a, of an 05 convertible up there. Um, uh, Jesus was died, he, but then he was resurrected. He came back and he looked like his former self, sort of, but he was much better, far superior. Uh, he, he, when he came back, he had, uh, so this vehicle uh, was the designers were kind of paying homage to the classic car when they rebuilt it, but it was rebuilt with modern safety standards and had all the modern electronics and modern suspension. It was just a far, more power, far superior vehicle to the one that it was replacing back in the original. Let me just make it a little more biblical for you. I know I'm being a wee bit ridiculous here, uh, but but here's what we see in the pages of scripture. Um, uh, Jesus' resurrected body was real. Uh, It could be touched, John 20, verse 27. Um, That was to differentiate him from a ghost. It wasn't just a disembodied spirit that came out of the tomb. It was a real body. Uh, He ate fish with his disciples, Luke 24, Acts 1. The wounds that Jesus had sustained were still present. 
You could touch them. You could feel them. John 20, verse 24. And all of this might sound like resuscitation, except Jesus' new body was different. Uh, He walked through walls. John 20, verse 19. He seemed to appear and then disappear. Like this was not the same. Luke 24, verse 31. Jesus, in that body, ascended back to heaven. Uh, And in Paul, we're going to look at it next Sunday, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, describes it as a spiritual body. And so there's something significantly different about this. Jesus came out of the grave with a resurrection body, new but better. Maybe even the better car analogy would be a 2021 all-electric Mustang Cobra Jet 1400. Okay, so there's a picture of, the, of, of it, super powerful car, but it's entirely electric. So Jesus would be environmentally friendly, of course, if he came back out of the grave. So anyway, we'll, you can decide at home, maybe that's dinner table conversation, what kind of car would Jesus be? Um, or you can just pass on that if you wish. I'm not saying it's a perfect analogy because all these cars are going to get old and rust and they will fall apart eventually. So the analogy breaks down. So that's a little bit at least about what resurrection was or is, but let's go back to our text, verse 12. Paul writes, but tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? Let me just pause for a moment and be empathetic. It must have been tough to be part of the first century church. I mean, so so many things were brand new. So many things were being thought through and attempted to understand, not the least of which was this subject of resurrection. How do they get their minds around it when they don't have a great car analogy like that, right? <laughs> they, they, understood, they understood that Jesus had been resurrected. Like they got that, they didn't contest that. The testimony of the eyewitnesses were present. Paul referenced that last week in the text we were looking at. He'd come out of the grave in bodily form, looking similar but different. But they were students of the culture. And in Greek thought already, they begun to think that spiritual is good and physical is bad. It would eventually mature into what was called Gnostic thought, but already there, this, is, this idea is present, and, and so it might be fine and dandy for Jesus to, to, to come out of the grave with this new supercharged body, <laughs> uh, but, but we don't have that expectation, like physical, yeah, and and. But before, Jesus, before Paul rather, gets to correcting this, we, I, wanna, I want you to hear something that Paul says about the resurrection of Jesus. That, that if it wasn't for the confusion in that first century church, I'm not sure, I'm not sure we would have had this beautiful little testimony to us about the significance of the resurrection. Let's just look at the text one more time. So why was Jesus resurrected? Verse 13 Paul writes, for if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In the process of correcting the the, the errant thinking in the first century church, Paul gives this real gem. There's kind of two of them here. Let me just lead you to this. Why was Jesus resurrected? Firstly, Jesus was resurrected to demonstrate and declare the success of his mission. Okay, we talked about this last week. Why why do we have hope? Uh, Because of Christ's love for us. Um, He died in my place. He took the penalty for my sin. His death covered my sin. Now Christians in the pages of scripture have have several different ways of of reflecting on this reality. Language that tries to get at something that is greater than our imaginations can fully comprehend. So how is it that my sin was atoned for? How did God make, how did God cover the horrific offense of my sin. Well, Jesus became my substitute. That's one kind of category of language, one way of talking about this. Isaiah 53, verse four. Matthew 8, verse 17. John 10, verse 11. 
If you want my, the passages of Scripture that reference these, text or email me. I'll send them to you. Jesus died as a substitute. But there's other language that gets applied to this question of how is my sin atoned for? Jesus paid the ransom for my sin. That's another way the writers of Scripture talk about this. Isaiah 51, verse 11. Jeremiah 31, verse 11. Hosea 13, 14. Matthew 20, verse 24. 1 Timothy 2, 6, etc. Here's the third one. Jesus rose victorious over the powers of sin and darkness and the grave. So he was my substitute. He was my ransom. He is my victor. He is the one who rose victorious over my sin or, or in, in order to demonstrate his authority over the power of sin and darkness. Isaiah 25, verse 8, Hosea 13, 4, Matthew 12, verse 30, Mark 10, verse 45, etc., etc. Here's the point. If it were not for the resurrection of Jesus, we would not have the assurance that the substitution was accepted, that the ransom was paid that the victor actually rose victorious over sin and death and the grave. It becomes the witness to, the demonstration that Jesus was successful in his mission. He, re- he demonstrates in this that everyone who belongs to Christ will be saved. Our hope is founded on something sure. No other leader of any religion has ever risen from the grave. You go to to their grave sites uh, and you can visit visit them in memorial and the good things that perhaps they did, but but their bones are there. Uh, You will not find the bones of Jesus anywhere anywhere in uh, in the Holy Land. Uh, There are two sites uh, that profess to be the burial site of Christ, pretty good evidence, evidence for either one, um, but his bones aren't there, okay? So, so everyone who belongs to Christ will be rescued. Now, I, I wanted to just kind of pause here and maybe put a point, a fine point on this and go back to what we looked at last Sunday, the first portion of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You may recall that I described it as a creed. It seems to be language that the first century church was using to summarize together what they were doing. So I took, took my hand at how would we put that into language that maybe would be accessible for us and maybe a creed that we would, could recite. So, so here's my attempt at this. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and now he presents himself to me. Would you say that with me? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. He appeared to Peter and then to the 12. He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and now he presents himself to me. So why was Jesus resurrected? Well, he demonstrates, he declared the success of his mission. But Paul references another thing here. Jesus was resurrected to, to show us what we will be like one day. Let, let me read it from verse 20. Paul writes, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest, and then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. The first of the harvest. Okay, that's agricultural language. Many of our English translations uh, use a one-word equivalent, one Greek word, one uh, English word, and in your translation it's probably first fruits, ESV, NIV, NASB, first fruits. Eh. Agricultural language, the first fruits of a crop indicate to the farmer the, the quality and the quantity of the crop that they can be anticipating once it all matures. 
And so this means that Christ's resurrection body gives a foretaste. It gives us an advance notification of that body which we will receive as believers. Jesus is the first sample. You are the great harvest. We're going to explore that a little bit more next Sunday because we begin, we're going to move into then, well, what is this afterlife to look like? What, is the, what do the scriptures actually say? Can we get out of, some of it out of mythology and into what the actual biblical expectation is? But for now, we, we've, we've reviewed what is resurrection. We've reviewed why was Jesus resurrected, demonstrate his victory, show us what's to come, which then leads us to will you be resurrected? And the answer is yes, absolutely, if you turn to Jesus. Paul has said, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. Listen to what Paul says, verse 21. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. So of course the problem is that death came to humanity. Father God's intervention through the work of his son is necessary because humanity is lost in sin. And Paul ties this back to the dawn of time. The account of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. I'd encourage you to read it this afternoon. Genesis chapter 3. A couple of observations about this. He says death came to the world through one man. It's representative. Rescue has come to the world through one man. Representative. Adam over here, Jesus over there. Now a couple of other observations. Notice that both, both Adam and Jesus, Jesus and Adam, are described by Paul. The language would suggest that they're real human beings. Nothing allegorical about Jesus, certainly. And Paul seems to put them in the same category as Adam, and so we'd have to say, well, nothing allegorical about Adam either. Death came through a man, is what he says. And notice that, though Eve took the fruit, again, Genesis 3, Adam takes the blame. Though Eve took the fruit, Adam takes the blame. That's instructive to us. I mean, anyone who leads anyone else, don't be afraid to take the heat as the team leader. Yeah, they made the mistakes. Yeah, it's on me. Dads, it's on you. We have a role in our families to, to, to carry the freight. Yeah, it's on me. I'm going I'm to carry this gladly. Just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, we all belong to Adam. Everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. Now, now that, that leads us to then say, okay, well, how can I be sure that I belong to Christ? Let, let me just offer this little test. Who owns you? Who owns you? Um, what, what commands your life? If, if the chips were down, what is most important to you. Let's look at what Paul says here in verse 24. After that, the end will come when he, Christ, will return, will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Destroyed every ruler, authority, and power. Let me ask again, what rules your life? What authority do you answer to? What power do you turn to? Let me just say, the assurance of your resurrection hope is found in the resurrection of Christ. It's the assurance of your resurrection hope. Not only was he the first fruits, not only was he demonstrating what we look forward to as those who belong to Christ, but he also demonstrates the beginning of the destruction of every ruler and authority and power, everything that competes with Jesus for the privilege or right 
to command your life is being destroyed, is being addressed in the power of Christ. Now certainly, Paul here is talking about, about spiritual forces in heavenly realms, Ephesians 6. But he's also talking about the power of sin to command your life. You no longer need to bow to the cravings, the desires that seem to boss you around, the, the self will ambition rather than the, the, the God will. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus came, lived, died, and was resurrected, his first coming, and his second coming will complete what he began. All of his enemies will be subject under his feet. And the last enemy, Paul says, to be destroyed is death itself. So in other words, we're living in this window, friends. It's this window of grace. It's this extraordinary period of time. Jesus having secured the victory of the cross, showing that victory in his resurrection, his second coming when he will judge the living and the dead. Evil will be vanquished uh, and, and thoroughly and finally judged. But we live in this in-between time, this period of grace, uh, when it's being determined, what will you do with Jesus? You, you see, the, the redeemed of the Lord, those who have been ransomed, everyone who belongs to Christ will receive new life. We get the foretaste of it now, and we get the full of it then. And we will be completely and utterly restored with one another and with God. The foretaste now, the full of it then. And then verse 28, Paul writes, then when all things are under his authority, the son will put himself under God's authority so that God who gave his son authority over all things will be utterly supreme over everything, everywhere. Let me just say that God who is supreme over everything, everywhere, invites you to sit at his table. That's a family invitation. Be part of his household. Embrace him as your father and follow him. Submit to him. You have resurrection hope beyond this life if you believe and follow Jesus. So, so we've talked about what is resurrection and why was Jesus resurrected. The, the question on the table then is, will you be resurrected? I want to invite you to come to the Lord's table this morning with a, 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 a shout of yes. In coming, I'm going to invite us to kind of go back to that creed that Paul writes, and, and, and receive it, state it as a, a summary of that which we've been learning through the pages of Scripture. Worship team, if you'd come, that would be great. Why don't you stand with me, friends, if you're here, you can stand at home too, but stand with me here, and let's us own this creed as ours, and say it together. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried, he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. He appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and now he presents himself to me. Friends, this is an invitation to embrace the gospel with, by which you are saved. The question is, what have you done with Jesus? And that will be the most significant question ever asked in the pages of history, and it will be the final question asked at the end of time. What have you done with Jesus? And the world will be judged based on the answer. Will you come to the table? Will you join Team Jesus? Will you place your faith and your trust in Jesus? Will you give 
yourself to him such that you belong to Christ? And if the answer is yes, we celebrate with you. 